my name is Duration. We do a show on Think Tech Hawaii called Finding Our Future every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. And we cover sustainability, progressive politics, and other local issues facing our community here. And today I'm really excited. We have a guest. His name is Gary Gill. He's a lifetime activist, has been a politician, worked in um, the state and other government agencies. So we're going to talk about tons of different things today. So thank you for being here, Gary. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So I think it would be good because I've heard a lot about your story, but um, for our audience, just sharing kind of your background, how you got started as a young person and mm. what you've been through since then. Well, to make a 60-year story as short <laughs> as we can. What's your life story? <laughs> uh, well, I'm born and raised in Hawaii and mm -hmm. born into a politically active family. My father was one of the organizers of the Democratic Party in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's a labor attorney by trade. Uh, he was elected to the Territorial House and uh, to the U.S. Congress and served as lieutenant governor, ran for governor twice. And this was all uh, you know, when I was growing up. Right. So, so the whole issue of running for office and being involved politically and fighting for progressive causes mm -hmm. or leading the liberal wing of the Democratic Party or whatever you choose to call it at the time uh, was just of my upbringing so mm -hmm. doing things political um, engaging in island politics and running for office myself just became second nature so, um, throughout uh, my early years of you know, passing out flyers from my dad on fort street you know since i was four years old pretty much <laughs> uh, all the way through um, more con community-based activism mm -hmm. uh, through high school it was uh, my time growing up, uh, coming of age was during the Protect the Ho'olawe Ohana, you mm -hmm. know, stop the bombing campaign. I was involved in that kind of thing, right. anti-nuclear, mm -hmm. um, international issues like uh, opposing American intervention in the third world mm -hmm. and the whole Contra issues and, you know, the foreign debacles of American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, also, I uh, got involved in the labor movement. I was a union shop steward in the mm -hmm. Hotel Workers Union. I represented about 250 or so, mostly working women in the housekeeping department at Sheraton Waikiki. I did mm -hmm. that for a better part of eight years. Uh, ran for office, got elected to the city council, served as council chair, ran for mayor. Um, I was mayor. Did you know that? No. Okay. We're, we're going to revise <laughs> history a little do bit it, there. Yeah. Well, it would be that. a whole better world if I had won that, that election now. That would have been better, but, I think. <laughs> but uh, then I served in a state administration mm -hmm. as the director of environmental quality control, as the deputy director for environmental health. I've also done nonprofit work with Blue Planet Foundation, mm -hmm. Kokua Kalihi Valley. Uh, had a role with OHA in opening up Waimea Valley mm -hmm. under their nonprofit. Um, and uh, since uh, the Ige administration, uh, I have been officially retired from state <laughs> government, uh, but doing consultant and volunteer work, and most recently uh, working doing environmental conservation work in the Waianais on 1,600 acres that my family has kuleana over to restore the native forest and uh, prevent degradation from wildfires and yeah. pigs and things like that so totally that's where i am there boom that was great summary that, that wasn't didn't take too long that was pretty good yeah <laughs> i guess i'm wondering what your what your perspective on politics today is mm -hmm. i mean i'm 27 and i'm like i feel like there's been so much that happened just in my mm -hmm. lifetime so far so mm -hmm. what is your perspective on it given that you've been through so much like both in hawaii but also nationally well certainly there's never been a more important time to get involved yeah. uh, there's never been greater threat to our democratic institutions mm -hmm. than we see now um, and I think that threat is coming from from two ways right? basically not to not to focus entirely on our current president but certainly the, the high profile mm -hmm. reversals of basic institutions of democracy uh, and safeguards of public health and of fairness uh, are reason enough to motivate people uh, to start to pay attention and to get involved because the threat is real. Uh, the ex existential threat by climate change and uh, just the environmental degradation that we are witnessing yeah. is, is another big motivator. Um, 
Uh, but I think what we're fighting is disengagement. Um, mm -hmm. And I've seen this throughout my entire life, even working in uh, a union setting where my work on behalf of the people in the housekeeping department affects them directly. Are you going to have a medical plan? Yeah. How much are you going to get paid? Mm -hmm. Trying to get people engaged in even those issues right. that clearly affect their daily lives has been a struggle mm -hmm. because folks are busy, they have other things, they have distractions, now everybody's on their phones. You know, they, they don't necessarily take the time as they used to um, right. to to be involved in anything from you know the PTA to you know their yeah. their own issues in in their workplace well, and what... and it's popular to be disengaged like nothing I do will make a difference yeah. and and that will take you until you have no choice right. and you will have to get engaged so better start early yeah so what is your feeling because I grew up with very little technology and then growing up it became like, mm. you know, everyone started to have cell phones when I was in middle school and high school. So I kind of have both worlds, like growing up playing with no technology mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. all day. Um, and then being someone who is semi-addicted to my phone, as most <laughs> people are today. So like I get both. And I also know that technology, what part of technology's intent was to free up people to engage or to do other things that were more fulfilling or mm -hmm. meaningful or impactful mm -hmm. in society. But it seems like it's done both in some ways. Like in some sure. ways it has really helped and in some ways it's been very distracting. Sure. And you grew up in a time, you know, fighting the nuclear arms race and things like that um, in your generation that, you know, you didn't have social media to blast things out to millions of people in a moment. You know, everything was much slower, mm -hmm. snail mm -hmm. mail type thing. So, yeah, how do you kind of, like, how would you describe yeah. how you feel about where we are today well, with technology and how that helps or hurts it's us. It's a tough question, and I don't know if an old dinosaur like me is the right <laughs> one to answer the question, but, um, you know, I have a cell phone in my pocket. Um, I'm fond of telling people that smartphones make you stupid. <laughs> yeah. Um, because they really do. You don't, you don't have to plan anything anymore. That's I look true. at my kids who are your age or younger, and it's like, they're frustrated because Nobody will commit to anything. It's like, it's let's true. go to the beach on Saturday. And, they, and it's like, oh, well, we'll see, right? Because something totally. better might come up between now and well, Saturday that they want like, to do. You know, you know, so, want to come, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think we're dealing with the, the same basic problem of engagement. Yeah. We just have different tools that allow it to happen a lot more quickly. Yeah. When I was organizing as a hotel worker, I had a, I had a printing press in my bedroom. I, I run mimeograph yeah. newsletters. You know, totally. we, had, we had it all set up. It was, it was great fun. Best job I've ever had in, yeah. of all these things. You know, I had a, a, one of the hotel worker maids was our, our poet and our, our, our three-dot columnist. And right. the, the pool attendant was, uh, drew my political cartoons because he was a great artist. And we had all kinds of people engaging. And I would type it up or have friends type it up. And I'd mimeograph it out. And I'd pass out these flyers. And that was high tech of the day, right? To right, get the, totally. the, the word out on my own mimeograph machine to help <laughs> organize people by passing out yeah. a flyer. And I don't think anybody does that anymore. I don't even know if you can get a mimeograph machine. No, I don't machine. even know what that is, really. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So, um, it, but it was actually getting the word out and, and building an organization mm -hmm. uh, around the written word and communicating to people through that medium, which I think is still strong and, and useful. Um, I read the newspaper in paper form every morning. Yeah. You know, I think it's important. Uh, but the the tools that we have now right. are, are just on an entirely different scale. And I think it, it can be and, and has been a real strong force for democracy. If you want to, like, protest, just pick your protest, Hong Kong or wherever it's going yeah. on today, people can connect and... In a day, a million people are in the streets. Okay, that Amazing. was not really possible. Right, it would take before. much longer than that. Yeah. So, in in a way, it can speed up that yeah. that interaction or that coordination or that political involvement. But it's not a substitute mm. for the hard work that it takes to really organize folks. Piling oh, yeah. people into the street is one thing. Actually, following through and making something good happen right. afterwards takes organization. Oh, totally. And and that's where you know, I'm fond of telling people who ask for it, my advice, who come out of kind of an activism uh, <laughs> tradition or they've been engaged politically because whatever it is, TMT or 
you know, wage issues or yeah. you know, whatever they're in front of the legislature for. Basically, organizing a protest is easy. Totally. It's easy. Mm -hmm. You call your friends, you're all pissed off, you go in the street, and then you go home. Okay? Right. Actually, organizing governance, mm -hmm. that's hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Developing the systems where decisions are made fairly, right. where laws are passed equitably, where, yeah. you know, where change happens incrementally. These are things that take a lifetime commitment, not like text you on the phone, see you on the street, let's catch you know, dinner at Zippy's afterwards. Yeah, okay. and never think about it again. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's the dynamic, would you say? So you shared a photo of the styrofoam ban or plastic styrofoam ban. They tried to pass in 89. Yes, when this I was on so the city council. This is so funny to me because I've been doing this since I'm, like, I was in college for like seven years. And we always say, everyone I know that I work with right now on this issue, we say, we've been trying to do this for over 10 years, but you're telling me that this has been a 30 year. Yeah, there's nothing new here. So what is the <laughs> dynamic? I know sometimes things like it took 40 years for us to like ban smoking, right? Uh -huh, in, uh -huh. in many public places. But what, where, where is patience like helpful uh -huh. with issues or, you know, where do we need to you know, organize better and faster and stronger to yeah. demand faster change? Because I don't think we don't have 30 years for a lot of the issues we're facing well, today. It's true. There are, there are many critical issues dealing with climate change and, and retreat from the coastline and things. This problem is in front of us right now. Yeah. And it is, it's frustrating for anybody um, who is thoughtful and engaged and has a life commitment to making a difference because rarely does dramatic change happen quickly and sustainably, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so I guess the first thing is to um, adjust your expectations. Right? <laughs> a lot of people, especially when you're young, think, oh, here's a problem, here's a solution, just, just do it and everything no will problem. change. Right? It yeah. doesn't really work that way okay, yeah. um, uh, it, for most things. There are times where change happens dramatically, but right. still it's a, it's a struggle to implement long term. Right. So, you have to be of the mindset that this is not a one-time deal. Mm -hmm. This is a lifetime quest. So if I look at my own life over the past 60 years, I've done everything from campaign for my father to campaign for myself to mm -hmm. organize demonstrations to you know, working through the nonprofit. I've, I've been in, in the community. I've been in politics, running, you know, making laws. And I've been in administration actually implementing laws. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can look back and say, wow, things really have changed. Like, for example, the yeah. bottle bill, right? You know yeah. how, how long people worked to try and get a five cent returnable deposit on beverage containers? Like <laughs> since the 1960s. It was a reality check, okay? yeah. And it wasn't until things came together um, when I was uh, deputy director for environmental health under the Cayetano administration, yeah. where the city administration was frustrated, their recycling coordinator, which was a position, by the way, I established when I was on the city council, yeah. with the support of, of the members of the council, we imposed that position on the, on the Fosse administration. <laughs> so they're getting all upset, you know, it's really hard to do recycling. I said, you know, you guys really want to do a bottle bill? Because, yeah. I mean, we can, but it's going to be a lot of work. It took us two years to get it passed, Yeah. right? But that was just, that two years, it had been decades before when people had proposed it, and it never even got a hearing at the legislature. Yeah. So I look back now and say, well, what is different in my career mm -hmm. you know, in terms of environmental management, um, solid waste management, things? Well, the bottle bill is, is a dramatic difference. Totally, uh, yeah. We are the most recent and the only time in, like, in the past 20 years that the state actually imposed a bottle bill. Right. And there's a lot of fixes that need to be done on it. It shouldn't be five cents. It should be probably 10 or 15 or 20 to make it, to make it uh, actually functional. Yeah. And the legislature's back not even paying attention to it. You know? yeah, so totally. you, you take this, you know, these issues incrementally past something dramatic, but it's still a lifetime of commitment. You haven't, yeah. We haven't solved the solid waste problem just because people are collecting you know, five cents on their aluminum cans and plastic bottles. Right. It was a step in the right direction. So, yeah. uh, you know, is it frustrating? Sure, government is frustrating. Governance in a democracy mm -hmm. is designed to be frustrating. Right. The, the founders of this country figured like, 
Well, having one king who te tells everybody what to do is kind of dangerous. Yeah. So let's take that power, give some to the administration, some to the House, some to the Senate, it's some less to efficient. the judiciary. Yeah. It's like you mix it all up there and then it takes yeah. a long time for things to happen. But when they do happen, they happen better. Right. That's, that's the faith in a democratic process. Right. That, if it's working well. Yeah. When, so, when you're engaged. So you can't, you know, the basis of it is democracy works. Democracy is people power, right? So yeah. the people, if they don't assert power, somebody else will. Right. And those totally. are going to be typically the rich and the elite who yeah. can design the system to work for themselves. Exactly. And they will if the rest of us are sleeping and let them do it. Well, that's a great note for us to go on break. <laughs> <laughs> and we will come back in a minute and talk more about all these on issues in Hawaii and politics abroad. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch, host of Out and About. It's a show that we have every other Monday on Think Tech Live here. We explore a variety of topics that are really interesting. We explore organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. We've got some amazing guests on here, like all the shows at Think Tech. So if you want to catch up on stuff, tune into my show every other Monday and other shows here on Think Tech Live. It's a great place to learn about stuff, to be informed. And uh, if you have some ideas, come on my show. Let's talk about it. See you later and aloha. Thank you for joining us. This is uh, Finding Our Future think on Think Tech Hawaii. We're here every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. My name is Duration. I'm the host for the show. And we have Gary Gill here, um, has been in the Honolulu City Council as the chair, worked in government agencies, and also as a grassroots organizer in the community over the span of his life. So um, thank you so much for all the work that you've done. I know it's a lot of commitment. Sometimes it's a lot of sacrifice. And we were kind of talking about, you know, politics and what patience and how things take a long time. And this is something that I think about a lot as an advocate and activist, you know, like feeling very impatient, which I think is common for young people. <laughs> <laughs> like, why can't we do this faster? Things are mm -hmm. so urgent, which I think sure. is kind of the, you know, the importance of having a new generation come up and demand things that they feel mm -hmm. are urgent for their um, time. But I also noticed that coming from kind of my nonprofit introduction was in L.A., where they were really well organized there. Mm -hmm. And we were doing stuff on immigrant rights, helping families not get deported, helping people get citizenship, passing bills at the federal level. And so when I moved to Hawaii, I've kind of felt since then, nine years ago, that that skill is not really that powerful here, mm. except maybe in the labor movement mm. in Hawaii. So I want to know your thoughts on grassroots organizing as a skill set that nonprofits have or don't have, um, how you can cultivate that, which ones are good at it, and how we can maybe improve upon that. Well, it, it's interesting that you, and it's good that you bring this mainland experience to Hawaii. Um, my friends, when I was younger than you and trying to <laughs> organize people. One of my friends referred to the University of Hawaii as the hotbed of apathy. Um, <laughs> I still like that. And, and I don't think that that's changed. Uh, and part of that is sort of the tropical malaise that we have. You know, so you're nice from outside. Hawaii, yeah, let's go to the beach, let's do it, things yeah. like that. And, um, you know, part of it is we take for granted in Hawaii the grassroots organizing that has been done by previous generations. Yeah. Like when my parents were organizing the Democratic Party in Hawaii in the 50s, which yes. now if you realize is like the dominant party of virtually everybody in the House and Senate is, is a Democrat, the governor is a Democrat. Well, that didn't happen just because. It happened mm -hmm. because people were knocking on doors, taking names, 
creating, this is before there were databases and computers. Yeah. So the database was a shoebox with file cards with people's names in yeah, alphabetical order. Yeah, it's so much order, easier right? now. Um, <laughs> and, and little notes on it, right? Crazy, you know, those yeah. kinds of things. So that's how it was done. Right. We, are, we have inherited that work. Mm -hmm. And for a generation or more, we've kind of like kicked back and said, well, there's no work left to be done, you know. It's, Life is easy now, right? Yeah. Um, but it's really not. Um, one, one example of grassroots organizing that was really successful um, was the Sandy Beach Initiative. Now, this is when I was just on the city council in the um, late uh, 1980s. And there was a proposal for development of houses along Sandy Beach, along the coastline there. Okay. And people w became more and more opposed to it. And they, they petitioned the city council, but the city council mm -hmm. approved it anyway. So then the, com the, the community went out and did a petition drive to put the issue on the ballot. And yeah. it went on the ballot and the people, the voters voted to save Sandy Beach. Yeah. Now, this didn't happen because people thought about it or they were enraged or they you know, called their congressman. They went out knocking on doors totally. and collecting signatures mm -hmm. across the island mm -hmm. in order to make this happen. Right. And eventually, long story short, but the Supreme Court threw out the People's Initiative and said, you don't have a right to save Sandy Beach. Wow. And, and the city council then had to take the action that they should have from the beginning totally. and change the zoning. Yeah. And, and su subsequently, the whole Ka'ivi coastline is, is, will never see more development than it has today right. because of that community activism and the grassroots organizing that took place. And we will still see that. It's manifested today in the Hawaii Kai Hui and the, the work that they're doing that has carried forth. And even Sandy Beach wasn't the, wasn't the beginning of it. The Sandy yeah. Beach Initiative was part of the whole uh, Save Queens Beach Initiative that happened 15 years before. Yeah. So these, this activism or the involvement in community organizing is never wasted. No yeah. political activity mm -hmm. is ever wasted. Mm -hmm. It leads to something else. Right. Uh, it, it builds on itself. And that's, totally. there's, there's no more important thing that people can do yeah. um, to leave a positive mark on this place that we love than to mm -hmm. be engaged in whatever element of community is attractive to you. I don't care if it's you know, the Boy Scouts or the PTA or whatever, yeah. but making a difference and being engaged is going to be something that the next generation benefits from. Yeah. Can you talk about, so there's this like issue of power. And mm -hmm. so the, there's a power in the people. I strongly believe in that. I've seen that work, you know. And then I would say the sentiment of my generation and maybe most progressive people right now is that although we have power, it's been co-opted mm -hmm. more than more than in pa in the past, where corporations have all of this power to influence elections, mm -hmm. influence policy. You know, the the city council chair chairman Ernie Martin, the previous one, just took a job as a lawyer for a for a development that he was protecting while he was in office. Mm -hmm. So that kind of revolving door is very disheartening for people my age and probably a lot of other people, and so. Can you talk about like the dynamics of power and you know how much we need to change power structure versus just organize well? I mean, mm -hmm. I know it's both, but... Mm -hmm. Well, the purpose of organizing is to affect that distribution right. of power. Right. I, I don't think anybody thinks it's success. Oh, you know, we held a rally, we made a lot of noise, that was good, you know, we're done. See no, you later. I mean, it, right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> achieve it. So, you know, it, to me, uh, it's interesting that you put it in, in those broad terms of uh, who has power, because in a democracy, the people are supposed to have power. Right. But in a democracy, when the people don't influence that power directly, yeah. someone else will. Right? There's, right. There's, there's this pile of things, let's put a pile on this table and say, there's like a hundred blocks here. Mm -hmm. And each one is one one hundredth of the power that's in the community. Yeah. Right? If you don't take that and exercise it, somebody else will take three or four of them, right? Oh, or yeah. ten, right? You know, so, um, and, and who tends to do that? Who, who has the resources to manipulate government mm -hmm. are large companies with, with money or okay. to some extent 
you can say, well, the trade unions have mm -hmm. certain power that they have because yeah. of the they've organized collectively to a certain cause, and right. they and they can put people in the streets to campaign for elected officials. Yeah. So they have a piece of power. It's not like uh, you know, it's all on one side and not the other, but it won't be in your side unless you're out there picking it and yeah. putting it in your pocket and, and organizing to, to take some of that power as, as a community or as an individual, as a voter. Yeah. Right? So everybody has one vote, right? But if you don't vote, you've just given your power to somebody else. Yeah, I guess I want to know, because I think that organizing around shifting that power is really important right now, because I think mm -hmm. that's a foundational thing to passing anything and changing anything we want to see. So what do you see as a, as a foundational policy or regulatory change we can advocate for mm -hmm. that would take big money out of politics? Well, I know a lot of countries have, but oh, I just yeah. don't know exactly what they've done. Yeah, and that's, that's been one of the, the foci of my political career, uh, that um, how to take money out of politics. Right. Right? And some people have addressed this by saying, well, we should have term limits, right? So that politicians can only be in so long, which is really, to me, cynical. It means, like, if you're a politician, you're only good for four, eight years before, before you, you sell corrupted. out and then yeah. you have to throw. But imagine, <laughs> uh, you know, to me, uh, I say that's not really appropriate. That's like cleaning house by throwing out your antiques. Yeah, right? You know, totally. sometimes there are some sometimes really good, good people in there, exactly. right? And so it shouldn't be that you expire as a politician <laughs> and you're no good anymore. Yeah. It should be that young people, people without money and resources, ought to have the, a better ability to compete. Mm -hmm. And that means, in part, taking money out of politics. What it also could be, I have a bunch of ideas on this. Yeah. But, but for example, go to the legislature now. How many hotel workers, how many maids, how many bartendresses None. Are, are, no, they can't, because they can't afford to. Yeah. Right? Who can be a legislator is who can take off from work. Or is year, independently employed, yeah. or is supported by somebody, an insurance company, a bank, a law firm, or something, okay. and then they can they can actually become a leader in the legislature right. and make mm -hmm. rules. So why don't we treat uh, candidates for public office the same way we treat members of the National Guard? Yeah, you, you don't have to quit your job. Yeah. Right. You have you have a not just a right. You have a responsibility to serve in government. Yeah, and totally. we together ought to support you. Right. In your employment. Yeah. Benefits. We ought to pay you at least as much as a legislator as you were making in your other job, totally. and give you a guarantee right to go back to your job when you're done in the legislature. Yeah, I like that. There's lots of things that we could do, like that, to increase public engagement yeah. and involvement. Um, it's difficult in the United States because of the our Supreme Court yeah. has ro basically ruled that you know money is free speech, and so you can't limit free speech. Therefore, you can't limit money. Um, I think it's bogus. Yeah. I, I, think, <laughs> I think it's really harmful right. uh, to the political process. Mm -hmm. But there's a long list of things that we could do right. to um, uh, encourage new people running for office. When my yeah. dad was first elected, it was a multi-member district. He came in third, and he still got to serve in the territorial house. Um, we've changed that now and made basically in, increasing the power and influence and the electability of the incumbents. Mm -hmm. and, and our current system discourages. It's really hard to beat somebody who's in there already. Yeah. Um, and we as a society need to deal with that because yeah. it's it's really discouraging. It's not encouraging. We would probably do better if we just elected our legislature uh, randomly. Like, like yeah, we, I we think just you're pick right. a number and right. say, hey, Doré, number 463, you're your in. turn. Your turn. You got to do it like jury duty. Like jury duty. Uh, you know, I like you know, that. Uh, it is. Well, that's, that's a good note to end on. I think, you know, democratizing our democracy makes a lot of sense. So mm -hmm. thank you for all of your insight. And, you know, it's really good to have your insight on the show and for. Our generation and just like the public because you have such a wealth of experience and knowledge that a lot of people have an experience and are probably curious about so thank well, you the last word is you know whatever you do may feel like it's insignificant yeah. but it's really important that you do it and in in my life when people ask me all the crazy things i've done it really boils down to i want to work with good people yeah and i want to get good things done totally and at the end of the day whether that's something big or small, right. it might be seemingly insignificant in the long run.
but it's been very important. It's been a great ride, and I'm not done yet. Exactly. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. My pleasure. Awesome. Well, so this is our show every other Wednesday, Finding Our Future, talking about progressive politics, sustainability, and other issues in Hawaii. So join us every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. Thank you.